Hello and welcome to tonight's uh, edition of uh, the Evening Review. My name is Tewan Jabela. Um, we will give you the front page of today of uh, Namibian Sun. And uh, after that, our good friends from ShopRite will have a small commercial for you. Don't go away. Welcome to our, our interview segment. Uh, tonight in the studio, I'm joined by Mr. Nome Shombe, a well-known uh, Vinduk lawyer who started uh, mostly as a human rights lawyer and then morphed into other branches of the legal fraternity. Uh, thank you, sir, for, uh, for coming through tonight. Well, thank you for inviting me. Sure, sure. L l l let's, start about, let's start with um, the developments of today, uh, where the the Supreme Court basically wrote yesterday, uh, but it, it only emerged uh, this morning, that they wrote uh, a letter to the lawyers of Pan Pambuleni Tula to say that uh, they are not going to entertain further appeals from him uh, after the judgment of, uh, what, what was it, what was the date earlier this month, uh, uh, last month? In February, yes. In February, yes. <coughs> um, what was your reading, your initial reading of that uh, reaction by the Supreme Court? Well, I was quite surprised, uh, mainly for three reasons which are quite fundamental to how the court system works. Yeah. One was that th this order, if one could call it the order that's in the form of a letter, yeah. was written by the registrar of the Supreme Court. Yeah. Now, the registrars of the courts don't adjudicate on cases. Yeah. Um, they are simply administrative functionaries of the court. Yeah. Um, the the court uh, that's the duly constituted court, whether it's yeah. you know three judges in the Supreme Court or maybe even five, mm. if it's a full bench, yeah. uh, they are the ones who would have to adjudicate on the matter and make a decision. Mm. So it's not very apparent or immediately apparent from the letter whether this was a decision by the court. Yeah. In other words, a, a duly constituted court, meaning yeah. judges, yeah. Um, who wrote the letter. Mm. So one would assume, uh, just looking at the letter, that that is in fact a decision by the registrar. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, the m more fundamental issue is also that, you know, courts are uh, supposed to be de delivering judgments in the open court. Yes. Now if this is a judgment or order, it wasn't delivered in the open court. Yeah. Uh, it has to be, the court has to convene, mm. and then a judgment being delivered by the judges. Mm. Uh, by reading out the entire judgment or just the conclusion of the judgment mm. and providing the litigants and generally the public with a, a copy of the judgment and the order. Mm -hmm. So this was not done in an open court. Yeah. But most fundamental is also that, uh, that uh, generally the courts are there, you know, and should constitute themselves to be available for persuasion mm. by the litigants. Mm. So they might form a preliminary opinion as individual judges or collectively, mm. but they must always be available mm. um, to, to put that aside, whatever the initial conclusions are, mm. and listen to the parties mm. um, and let the parties persuade them one way or the other, yes. um, uh, carefully consider what the parties have done, <coughs> yeah. and then a ruler make a judgment of that. And what we normally understood by hearing of uh, which is what the constitution requires is yeah. a hearing before an independent um, uh, court or tribunal is that the the a hearing constitutes obviously the pleadings that have been filed whether it's under oath statements uh, other documents that may be filed mm. but that also includes the written oral submissions by the different uh, legal practitioners or the parties themselves mm -hmm. uh, to convince or persuade the court one way or the other 
by telling the court, if you look at the facts mm -hmm. in this way and the law in this way, you will have to arrive at a con conclusion like this. And the mm -hmm. other party would obviously try to convince the court the other way around. Yes. Look, if you look at the facts this way and uh, the law that way or interpret the law in a different way, mm -hmm. uh, you will arrive at a different conclusion that is asked by the other party. But that constitutes a hearing. Mm -hmm. And um, and and it seems it did not happen here. Yeah, yeah. Um, the parties did not go to court with their legal practitioners to uh, go and what we call advocacy is trying to change mm. um, the thinking of a particular judge and then um, convince a judge that your case is more valid than the, your opponents mm -hmm. and then they would pen a judgment based on that. Mm -hmm. um, this is the contestation of ideas that yes. you have in the open courtroom which is supposed to be open. There are very, very few and very strict requirements when the court would not be open. Mm. But this has not happened. So those are the three issues why I'm surprised mm. of mm. this latest development. Uh, tell me, Norman, the, <coughs> the, oh, the, so in law it is allowed for one to appeal a Supreme Court judgment? No, no, no. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an appeal in the first place. What, what, what was considered now. Mm. Uh, it's an application for the court to review its own judgment. Okay. Um, uh, that, you know, and there's an interpretation in the Constitution and the Supreme Court Act that the, the Supreme Court's decisions are final mm. unless set aside by re on review by the own court, yeah. by, by the Supreme Court or by Act of Parliament. Yes. And um, what the applicant in this particular instance did is that, well, there was a judgment. I'm not happy with how they arrived at the decision. Mm. I'm going back to court and ask the court to review it. Uh -huh. um, whether it merits or no merits, that's obviously a, a separate issue and that yes. is an issue that had to be ventilated in the court. Yeah. But the process that has happened with a letter from the registrar to say, well, we're not going to have your case heard. Yeah. The decision was final. Um, that for me was, I believe, was irregular and that is in fact what the applicant sought to do is to go and try and convince his judges mm. why his um, view should have been adopted. Mm. And of course the opponents, uh, these opponents are qu quite entitled to and they have been called upon to come to court mm. to come and give their submissions as to why um, the court was correct in the interpretation of the judgment. Uh, approximately a month earlier. Mm, mm. Um, and, and that's really, I mean, the court, an applicant, any litigant goes to court yeah. uh, with a full knowledge that his or her case might be dismissed. Mm. Um, but that's after you have presented arguments. And yes. you might quite conceivably uh, be able to convince uh, judges mm, mm. Um, that your case is good and therefore they have to rule in your favor. So in this case, you, you don't appeal for l for, for leave uh, to for or leave for the for your for, your, for that judgment to be re reviewed. You just go straight because in the High Court, I know uh, as a layman that uh, somehow if you want any judgment to be reviewed, you have to uh, to file for leave to appeal. But in the Supreme Court, how, how does it? No, go? no. <coughs> in, the, in the High Court, I mean, uh, leave to appeal is in very few instances where it's required. No. Okay. Sometimes it's it mostly required when it's an interlocutory matter. It the, the judgment that was uh, given or the ruling that was given doesn't dispose of the case. It's mm. uh, really, you know, on the point of certain evidence shouldn't be allowed or should be allowed or mm. who, whichever witness should be uh, um, heard and not, you know, who should be testified. Yes. But also if you have appealed from a lower court to the high court, yeah. your second appeal from the high court to the Supreme Court, you also would require leave to do that. Mm -hmm. And then obviously in criminal cases, you would always require leave to appeal from the um, the the High Court to the Supreme Court. Mm. But in this instance, mm. you don't require leave. Mm -hmm. I, it's a normal application, yeah. like all applications, that you would then just bring to the Supreme Court um, uh, in the election matter where yeah. there's a presidential challenge. Yeah. Uh, the law requires you to approach the Supreme Court and only the Supreme Court to challenge mm. the outcome of a presidential election. And there was a, an application. It was brought mm. in terms of the law. Uh, it was partially successful. Mm. The applicant then felt in those parts where he was not successful, the court may have made a mistake mm. and is seeking this court to review its own decision again and come perhaps to a different conclusion to that. Mm -hmm. I do understand there are some apprehension by many people. Mm. It is like, what happens then 
if that person or the, uh, a respondent is unsuccessful in the second review application, mm -hmm. can that person again bring another review application and say, well, mm -hmm. your judgment was wrong, uh, yeah. Supreme Court, please correct it in this way or that way. Yeah. And kept and uh, it's a cycle and everyone yeah. just keeps on bringing. Mm -hmm. That is the real apprehension that I have mm -hmm. uh, or that I do see that some people might have in terms of what the procedure that's been adopted now. Yeah. But I mean, as I say, it's not, I, I, I don't know what the merits are or demerits of yeah. the application. Yeah. And that's not a concern that I have. Mm -hmm. The concern that I have is that the process that has been adopted by yeah. seemingly the registrar yeah. in throwing out a case yeah. without the judges having heard it, mm -hmm. without the judges having given the opportunity to the parties and yes. the legal practitioners yeah. to advance arguments yeah. in, in the effort to persuade the court one way or the other. Yeah. That is a fundamental problem that I yeah. have. So in law, uh, the Supreme Court can be asked to revise our decision. That's and, and the, the court has done it in the that's past. Provided. The court has done it in the yeah. past that it, it had ruled in a particular judgment. Mm. There's one case that stands out mm. where a person raised a certain point in the High Court about the jurisdiction of the court, mm. uh, lost, uh, won in the High Court, and mm. the state appealed as a criminal matter. Yeah. The state appealed to the Supreme Court, and this person lost in the Supreme Court. In other words, the state won. Mm. Um, and his trial then continued. Mm. Um, and, and there was a separate case, uh, a similar facts, mm. that came back to the court um, through the High Court system all the way to the yeah. Supreme Court. And the court ruled in favor of that individual and said that the court doesn't have jurisdiction there. Mm. And the first guy then went back to court and said, well, if you ruled in this particular way in this second case, you yeah. should have uh, ruled That's also same. similarly in my case. Yeah. And those facts are quite maybe distinguishable, but they, they, they're important to know that what happened is that two persons, uh, they were more, but mm. the two who are of concern here were abducted Mm. by the Namibian authorities from Botswana, mm. brought into the jurisdiction of Namibia, and then prosecuted mm. and um, separately in two different cases. Mm. They were in the same vehicle. They are uh, abducted, kidnapped, in other words, mm. um, by the same police officer on the same day in mm. the same vehicle mm. and brought into Namibia. The one guy won his case mm. and the other one not Trust. in the Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah. And the Supreme Court then uh, had to again hear this yeah. application from uh, the person that they 10, 15 years earlier yeah. ruled against and said, well, we made a mistake. Yeah. We agree with you. We'll, we'll release you. Uh -huh. And he was released. Okay. You know. Now, so so in that process again, and, and, and I know I'm, I'm pestering you about this process, but I, but I need my, my viewers to understand this process. So. If, if the court, this Itula application, uh, application for review of that judgment uh, was successful, or not successful necessarily, but, uh, but uh, the, the same bench would have uh, listened to that um, application or, were you, or is it a procedure that uh, once they start application for, for review of judgment, that a new bench must... must I, I, don't, I don't think it's uh, uh, as important as uh, ultimately that the matter must be heard. Mm. But I think generally it would have to be the same bench yeah. um, that you would have to convince again that you made a mistake yeah. and you should have ruled in this particular way. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about um, the, the ECN has been... Okay, f first might be the... Wh what did you make of the judgment last month where the court says the use of EVMs without uh, a paper trail was uh, illegal or unconstitutional, un unconstitutional but the results Im emerging out of that process are, are upheld. W what was your reading of, th of that? Well, I think that's also the, the issue that Dr. Itula had when he approached the court for the second time. Uh, generally, I, I find it not acceptable that um, you know you would declare a tree to be poisoned but then you say the fruits of that tree uh, edible. are edible. <laughs> um, uh, and that's, that's quite a common yeah. um, issue that we have in courts, is that yeah. you know, the, the fruits of um, the poison tree yeah. are affected and tainted in mm. the same way as the, the tree itself. Mm. Um, uh, I, I want generally the constitution and the constitutional rights to be vindicated. Yeah. Uh, a party went to court and asked the court to set aside the presidential elections. Yeah. 
uh, or the outcome of the presidential elections based on uh, unconstitutional conduct by the minister in, you know, um, uh, uh, enacting certain portions of the law. Mm. The court agrees that that was wrong of the minister to do that. Mm. But they said, well, you know, the outcome of this election uh, can't be affected by that, and therefore the election continues. Mm. I just find it difficult to swallow that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, otherwise, you know, that's uh, the system that we have chosen is that courts make decisions. Mm. We don't have to agree with it. We don't have to be happy with it. Yes. But we live with it. Mm. And if the law, whether it's the statutory law or the constitution or both, makes provision for further uh, litigation, whether mm. through appeals, reviews, etc., mm. um, then a party can do that. I have no particular objection to that. Yeah. I might disagree with the approach that's been taken or the legal arguments that are being advanced, mm. but uh, if the law allows for that, that's democracy. That's what we call a constitutional democracy, mm. 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 and no one should prevent that party from doing that. Indeed. It's not uncommon yeah. in this country that litigants you will see it quite regularly in criminal matters where people with deep pockets mm. would uh, litigate before the trial even starts, yeah. litigate back and forth yeah. uh, between the High Court and the Supreme Court, yeah. and the ultimate uh, the trial starts. Mm. Just to think about it, uh, the case was State versus Tekla Lamek, the yeah. case was State versus uh, Upindi. Um, you know, people those, have those, been those trials within trials, trials within trials, and then mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. ultimately end up in the Supreme Court and back again. Mm -hmm. um, that's not uncommon. Yeah. So it's a quite a common common feature of our constitutional democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and 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 how much in terms of accountability, how much responsibility must ECN take in in all this whole whole thing now? Because the uh, and I'll talk to you about that later. The, this whole demonstrations that are being planned and, and all these things and people fear for the safety and security of the country. But without going into that for now, how much responsibility that must ECN take over all this squabbling now because of the manner the elections was, uh, was conducted? Well, uh, I, I, well, at the beginning, ECN should have had much more competent managers and competent lawyers to give advice to it. That simply did not happen as it turned out. Yeah. Um, but of course, people can misinterpret the law, and uh, we have done it. I have done it. Uh, um, it it's it's part of human nature. Mm. But I mean, you know, they they are the ultimate administrators of elections. Yeah. They are the ones who must make sure that the ultimate result of a, any election is a true reflection of the will of the voters. Mm. Um, with elections without electronic, without a paper trail mm. with the electronic voting machines. Mm. Um, part of the criticism that I have with it, if you ask ECN today to print out um, the election results in a particular way that we can see who, what was voted for, yeah. how many voters came yeah. to a particular, they can't provide that because yeah. it's a computer. Yes. That they have absolutely no control over how they can get the outcome of it. Mm. Um, uh, and I think that's the reason why the Supreme Court has declared that invalid also, because mm. the law provides for audit paper trail mm. that any voter can then challenge the election and say, we want a, a, a recount of the votes, mm. um, which ECN would not be able to do that. Yeah. And um, ECN obviously at the final say of how this must happen, mm. um, and they simply just failed in their statutory and constitutional obligations yeah. towards the Namibian nation. Mm -hmm. the, the second last question, Norman, is uh, uh, your observation since, um, the I think since October last year, when uh, when Itula sort of uh, was recognized as, a, as, official, as an official candidate now, and uh, then there were court cases challenging already the use of e EVMs going into the elections. There were issues of jurisdiction and all these kind of things. But, but I want your assessment on generally how peaceful and legally sound all these machinations have uh, rolled themselves out in the, in the process. There, there's been a lot of demonstrations. There's been a lot of uh, court challenges. But from a legal point of view, <coughs> how democrat how do i put it how, how has um, how legally sound and, and, and 
tolerant has all these processes have all these processes been uh, leading well, up to today? Well, I think I mean, uh, you know, we, we don't have anyone. I don't. I don't know of anyone mm. who has been injured, yeah. who's been bodily harmed by any uh, um, demonstrations and you know violence uh, leading up to the elections, yeah. or even immediately after the elections. Yeah. We don't have that, and that's very good because that's what what the what is required in yeah. terms of our constitution is that people yeah. are entitled to peaceful demonstrations. Yeah. I do see the law enforcement authorities talking a lot about you know civil war and violence <laughs> and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, partly, it's, it's probably to justify the their the employment, their yeah. jobs. Mm. Um, but generally, people have the right. Mm. I, they have to uh, start interrogating this issue by from the premise to recognize the ordinary person's right to demonstrate yeah. um, before they can even start saying that people are going to be violent and so on. We have not seen any of the violence. Yeah. People are fairly tolerant in this country. Yeah. Um, they they might have very robust uh, political discussions, yeah. um, which, by the way, is necessary. Uh, and I would encourage robust discussions about yeah. it, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, but then also, we don't we have not seen the violence that the mm. law enforcement agencies are talking about. Mm. I don't say people should go over to violence, not at all. Yes. Um, exercise your right to peaceful demonstration as much as you can. Mm. Um, keep on pushing the boundaries for that uh, without being violent. Yeah. The moment you start being violent, you as a, that individual who did that would lose that right mm -hmm. to peacefully demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 this is a quick thing that just came to mind now. The, Today we spoke to the chief of police, uh, Sebastian De Tunga. We, we needed uh, his comment on, uh, because there's now these planned demonstrations on whether people should, in, should uh, attend independence uh, celebrations in two weeks' time or not. And uh, one of the comments that uh, De Tunga made to Ohone, my, my one of my, my colleagues, mm -hmm. is to say that uh, people should not um, uh, call for boycotting of the of the event i am thinking uh, is a call for boycott within the framework of uh, of, of of expressing your views as a person or absolutely does, uh, yeah absolutely yeah. look i mean the, the fact i mean the freedom of expression doesn't just mean uh, speech which is agreeable to the next person yeah. could also mean that you know i disagree and I've tried to descend from social media to look at, I've made a fairly long comment this morning around the independence celebrations. I don't know, uh, I think generally, yeah. people are saying we're not attending the independence celebrations, the organized official celebrations. Mm. But they don't necessarily say that we're not celebrating mm. independence. Mm. Independence, the fact of independence, that can be celebrated and you mm. can celebrate it in your own way. There's mm. no particular, there's no law that says you can only celebrate it in this way and mm. not that way. Mm. Um, that's the first one. The second one is that, um, uh, of course, people do have the right to say, boycott the event. Mm. And the event is the official, w if I understand it correctly, the official event where, you know, the leaders will be speaking, the president and others mm. will be speaking uh, where foreign dignitaries will be invited to, mm. whatever. And I, you and I can have differences of opinion as to why people should attend and why people should boycott it. Yeah. Um, but I do understand people saying, look here, 30 years of independence, yeah. and what do we have? We have hospitals that are collapsing, we have an education system that is an unmitigated disaster, we have a massive shortage of housing. Mm. Our squatter camps are growing at the moment now, exactly 50% of the population in Vinduk lives in the squatter camp. Mm. Um, you know, we had newspaper reports mm. uh, emanating from government, uh, official government reports to state that close to a million people, close to 50% of the population are, are food insecure. They mm. need food security. Mm. Unemployment is unabated. All of this, and I said, look, you know, we're spending so much money mm. going to independent celebration, mm. um, you know, this year's one is the smallest of all of them, mm. which puts into question what was spent in the previous years. Mm. 
at one million dollars this year. Previous years it went up to thirty million dollars mm. uh, some time ago. Um, uh, but you know, people, it's their money. Mm -hmm. They are entitled to say maybe you shouldn't spend it. Mm. Maybe you should use it to okay. renovate the hospital. <laughs> maybe you should yeah. use. You know, we just had floods in yeah. some yeah. parts of uh, the city and in some parts of the country. Mm. Uh, those flood victims need assistance. Exactly. There's a compassionate and passionate uh, state. Yeah. We are supposed to be assisting those people with yeah. uh, just getting them some basic. Uh, needs mm. sorted out, um, that their dignity is restored, yeah. and they can live their life accordingly. We see kids being carried through rivers and swamps mm. Mm. to go to school. Um, you know, n no leader worth his salt, his or her salt, would sit with conscious, a good conscious, in you know, a beautifully ventilated yeah. uh, gazebo at Independence, <laughs> and speak of. <laughs> uh, very nice things that we have done in yeah. the past when we have these people suffering. Yeah. That's my view. The final one, I'm, I'm just picking your brain on this one because I'm, I'm personally very, very worried uh, about some things that I saw today. Um, so you have this uh, Itula people saying, no, they're going to demonstrate uh, to uh, air their frustration, also linked to election results and, uh, mm. and independence. And now, later in the day, I see a letter emerging from the ruling party also saying that uh, they are going to hold a counter demonstration of their own, mm. uh, I think, on the same day. H how wise is that? Well, uh, your freedom of expression is obviously not limited to a particular day. Yes. And I think both camps should be able to should be allowed to demonstrate, as long as it's peacefully, and the police and other law enforcement ag agencies should be able to control the crowds and that sort of thing. But generally, I mean, I don't think any particular problem with that. People mm. are peaceful. Yeah. Um, let them ventilate their frustrations. I think it's better to have people ventilate their frustrations through public demonstrations, public speeches, mm. the way I'm doing it now, talking yeah. about my frustrations, yeah. than keeping it in and becoming explosive yeah. later on because yeah. you kept too much in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we should actually encourage this. Yeah. Yeah. We should encourage people to speak out um, and, and say what they want to say and the mm. leaders must listen yeah. and in future then be able to take remedial action. Yeah. Uh, having listened to the concerns of the public and then implement appropriate policies and programs mm. that would resolve those frustrations. No man, thank you very much for coming through, man. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, Th that was Norman Shambe, uh, uh, a local lawyer, speaking to us about uh, events that are happening in the country right now around elections, about uh, alleged plans to boycott the independent celebrations in n in two weeks' time, and uh, yeah, that that sums up uh, tonight's show. Uh, thank you for watching.